So good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to introduce um, Tanisiro Bhikkhu, as he's known in in uh, the monastic circles, and um, often he's informally called Ajahn Jeff, Ajahn meaning teacher, or sometimes Tan Jeff, and he's the abbot of a forest monastery in San Diego County, the forest being an avocado orchard, and uh, comes out of the, the Thai forest tradition, and he practiced in Thailand for many years, and... Uh, in the very early 90s came and helped establish this monastery in San Diego that's a wonderful meditation monastery some people here have gone there and practiced with him uh, 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 at his temple at his, at his monastery uh, some of you uh, have met him before might have met him uh, indirectly uh, from the various writings he's done and many of them which are made available often here for free uh, here at our center um, most of the free books available here are from him the uh, he has um, translated uh, the works of many of the great Thai forest masters into English. He's also done an uh, amazing uh, uh, job translating a lot of the discourses of the Buddha into English. And right now it's four volumes, and the fifth volume is coming out. And he's also um, uh, wrote a wonderful commentary uh, of the teachings of the Buddha, a variety of commentary study guides, one of the uh, really greatest, one, he can't point to anything that's really the greatest that he's done, but um, I think one of the great things that has kind of really lasting, important value is a book called The 37 Wings of Awakening, um, where he goes through this very important teaching. And uh, he also has his own essays on Buddhism. Uh, I think there's three, three now, right? Mm-hmm. No, three essays and three volumes. Also, three, volumes. Also three volumes and also three volumes of his talks on meditation practice. So he's quite pro- uh, a productive man. Wonderful writing, and um, it's a really a <clears throat> uh, a pleasure to have him here. And um, you know, for me personally, I've it's been a very important. His teachings have been very important for me. His friendship and he's an example. And I hope that um, as we kind of move forward here at IMC and develop our practice here, that uh, the very best of his examples uh, carry through here into our center as well. So thank you. Thank you. After an introduction like that, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'd like to talk today about some head and heart issues. Here in the West, we tend to think of the head as one thing and the heart as something else. Your head is involved in intellectual activity. Your heart is concerned with your emotions. And sometimes they're talking to each other and sometimes they're just going their separate ways. Whereas if you look in the Buddhist cultures, starting with the Pali Pali language, going through the modern languages, um, often the word for for mind is the same word for heart. Um, Now you may think of this as a linguistic oddity. In Thailand, for example, the word jai is also interchangeably used with jit, which both both of them mean head and heart. In Pali, jitta can mean head or your mind, and it can also mean your heart is when you develop a heart of goodwill or a heart of equanimity. This is also a citta. Um, but I think it goes deeper than just a linguistic oddity. I think it points to something very important, that in Buddhism, head issues and heart issues are basically the same. For example, yesterday we talked about dependent core arising, which is a very heady head issue. But the whole purpose of dependent core arising, the, the teaching itself, is based on f- trying to find a way to put an end to suffering, which is very much a heart issue realizing that the important issue in life is suffering and then trying to use your mind to get around the problem of suffering so you actually bring bring some intelligence to your heart in a way that you can put an end to suffering. And in the same way, some of the other teachings that we tend to think of as more as heart teachings could use a little infusion of head sometimes. Um, The example I'd like to talk about this morning are the Brahma Viharas. These are sometimes translated as the sublime attitudes Literally, they mean the dwelling places of Brahmas. The Brahmas are these gods who live up in the very high heavens. And they live in an attitude of unlimited goodwill, unlimited compassion, unlimited empathetic joy, and unlimited equanimity. Um, With the stress on the word unlimited. Now, these are sometimes referred to simply as goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. These are emotions that ordinary human beings have. Um, but to develop them into Brahma Viharas, we have to turn them into unlimited emotions.
emotions. For example, you have goodwill. The Buddha's basic assumption about for all of us is that we have goodwill for ourselves, goodwill for the people we love, goodwill many times for the people we ordinarily meet. But there are going to be people for whom it's very difficult to feel goodwill. I'm sure you can think of a couple examples right now. <laughs> that if you've been practicing the Brahma Viharas and you get to the point where you say, okay, I spread goodwill to people you don't like, um, certain people you know, rise up in your mind very quickly. And the question is, what are you going to do about those people? Um, you can't pretend that you, if you have any ill will for them. The Buddha is not teaching you to pretend that you like them. And can, exactly, in fact, I'm not very articulate this morning. I'm kind of woozy from yesterday. Um, he's not asking you to like you, these people. You don't have to like someone in order to feel goodwill. There can be people out there that you dislike, but you really don't want them to suffer. Because many times the people you don't like, if they're suffering, they get worse. Yeah. <laughs> <It really laughs> so it's in your own interest to wish them some goodwill. <laughs> But still, we run up against people for whom it's very difficult to feel goodwill. Or if it's, for, if you're, on the other hand, if you're trying to develop an attitude of equanimity, there are people for whose suffering that you have a hard time feeling equanimity about them. People that are really too close to that you really have a lot of affection for. And the idea of their suffering is something you just cannot be equanimous about. And yet, it's in your own interest that you're able to develop these attitudes whenever you need them. Because this is what the Brahma Vihara is all about. Your ability to send goodwill or act out of an attitude of goodwill toward anyone in any situation, when it's appropriate. The same goes for compassion. Goodwill basically is just a basic desire for happiness. Compassion is when you see someone suffering, you would like to see an end to their suffering. Empathetic joy is when you see someone else who's happy and prospering, and you, you take joy in their happiness, you take joy in their prosperity, you're not jealous of it, you don't resent it. And as for equanimity, there are going to be cases for the people that you wish goodwill for simply cannot be happy. And you've got to learn how to develop equanimity in cases like that. Um, in many ways, equanimity is the reality check on the other three. You want goodwill, you want, you want people to be happy, you want the people who are suffering to end their suffering. Um, for people who are already happy, you would like them to continue to be happy. But there are times when it just can't be based on past karma and other issues. We're going to get into this in a moment. And in the cases like that, you have to develop equanimity. Because otherwise you spend all of your time getting upset about the people who are suffering whom you can't help. Or the people you would really like to see suffer a little bit more and they're not suffering. Um, <laughs> and you can't do anything about it. Well, if you waste your energy getting upset over those situations, it's going to be very difficult to focus your energy on areas where you actually can make a difference. So this is where equanimity comes in. So these are attitudes that um, we have to some extent. Now the question is, how do you turn them into unlimited attitudes so you can apply them whenever needed? Um, sometimes we're taught that goodwill is something we have by nature. You know, our Buddha nature is the nature of compassion or compassion and goodwill. And as I mentioned yesterday, if anyone would have been qualified to talk about Buddha nature, it would have been the Buddha, but he didn't. The Buddha never mentioned Buddha nature. He never said basically human beings are basically good. He never said they're basically bad. What he said is the nature of the mind is so variegated, it's even more variegated than the animal world. You think about all the different kinds of animals that are out there, starting birds and crawling animals and creeping animals and mammals and reptiles and everybody. There's lots and lots and lots of kinds of animals out there. And the Buddha said the human mind, or any mind, is even more variegated than that. We're capable of anything. So the question is, what are you going to do with this capability to do anything? What the Buddha does assume across the board is that we all desire happiness. This is something, a basic assumption for all of his teachings. This is why he teaches about the Four Noble Truths, because they focus on the issue of how we're suffering, why we're suffering, how we can put an end to suffering. It's based, he's assuming that you want to put an end to suffering, that you want to be happy. That's why he's teaching. But he also recommends that if you really want to be happy, one of the things you have to learn how to do is take this desire for happiness and make it universal. Spread it around. And the question is, how do you do this? You know, as I said before, you can't pretend that you're running up against somebody. Thoughts of goodwill are not cotton candy that you just kind of spread over the world. It's not like a big marshmallow cream that you put over the world and pretend that you know, there's nobody in there that you don't like or that you feel ill will for. When you're spreading thoughts of goodwill, you are bound to come up 
if you're being honest with yourself, against people for whom it's difficult to feel goodwill. And you've got to train yourself to understand why you feel ill will for that person, how to undo the ill will so that you can replace it with goodwill. This is where you have to bring in your head to train your heart. And the head teachings I'm going to talk about here are actually fairly simple. One of them is the teaching on karma, that people will receive, people will experience happiness or experience pain based on their intentions, both their past intentions and their present intentions. In fact, the Buddhist teachings on karma combined with causality point out the fact that your experience of the present moment is composed of three things. The results of your past intentions, your present intentions, and the results of your present intentions. So you've got three things interacting here. And so the results here, the results of past intentions, the results of present intentions, usually register in terms of either pleasure or pain, happiness or sorrow. The intentions here are the causes, both past intentions and present intentions. And those are the things you want to focus on. First, to understand when you're wishing happiness for somebody, exactly what it is that you're wishing. And then secondly, when you have a wish, what does it mean to wish? If you have an unskillful wish, can you take it apart and how do you replace it with a more skillful one? This is where the teachings on karma and causality um, are effective in training the heart. First, on the issue of understanding what it is when you're wishing for happiness. You're wishing for the causes of happiness. Happiness isn't something that just kind of comes floating in. When you're wishing for someone to be happy, you're essentially wishing that they will create the causes for happiness. One. Secondly, if you see that you're in a position where you can help alleviate somebody's suffering, you go ahead and you do that. Okay, there are, happiness isn't something that just comes floating in and floating away. I have a student who spends most of her time at, with um, practicing Tibetan Buddhism. Occasionally she comes down to the monastery because, as she puts it, she says, Theravadans are so common sense. <laughs> and she says every now, now and then she needs a reality check. Um, and a while back, she was having problems with, with her landlord. Her landlord was going to sell his property. And he was trying to get all the different people in the, in the apartments to sign a, a, a statement falsifying their rent levels for the past couple of years. And she didn't like this. And she didn't know what to do. So what she did is she went into her room and she sat down and she imagined him, as she told me, with five cars, a beautiful house, just all kinds of things to think of him as being happy. I said, no, 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 that's not what you want to wish for. <laughs> First off, you go and you talk to the other tenants. You get together and you say, no, we're not going to sign this paper. And then you go and you th if you want to imagine him being happy, think of him doing things that will lead to happiness. Thinking of, of him being generous. Think of him being virtuous. Think of him meditating. In other words, you're wishing for that person to find the causes of happiness and to act on them. That's what it means when you're wishing that somebody's going to be happy. Now, when you look at somebody's situation, you realize that some causes for happiness or pain come from the past, and you can't do anything about those. And if a, past, a person has done unskillful things in the past, the results of those unskillful actions are going to have to come. This is where equanimity comes in as your reality check, because there are going to be certain things when dealing with that person you simply cannot change. So instead of getting upset about those things, you learn to treat those with equanimity, and then you focus on what you can help or where you can be a help and what you can change. This applies both for people we have trouble liking and for people we like very much. For example, someone in your family may be suffering from Alzheimer's. Now, if you get upset about the fact that they got the Alzheimer's and let yourself get worked up over that, it's going to limit your ability to actually be helpful to the person and say, well, where can you be of help? Equanimity here is mainly a, a device for helping you focus your priorities, when you realize when you're up against some past karma that you can't change, you focus on the areas where you can. At the same time, it focuses you on the fact that people experience pleasure and pain not only from past karma, but also from present karma. Maybe you can help change their attitudes towards what they're experiencing right now. That's where you really can make a difference. So you focus more on the present and you let the past go. Um, Another teaching that's helpful in terms of karma is when you see somebody suffering, <clears throat> there's sometimes you hear the, the, uh, the argument that, well, if you see somebody suffering and you think about karma, then you say, well, they deserve to suffer, so you might as well just leave them alone. That doesn't work that way. Okay. As I said, people's suffering depends on past karma, but also the present karma. Secondly, <clears throat> when you look at somebody, you don't know what karmic seeds they have, what they've done in the past. Maybe they're experiencing 
the results of past bad actions, and the results of those bad, act, bad actions are about to end if that person meets somebody kind who's going to help. You never really know. I heard one, someone once say that if you want to see somebody's past, you look at them in the present moment. And what you see in the present moment tells you about their past. If you want to see their future, you look at what they're doing now in the present moment. That tells you about the future. This is not really true. Because there's a lot of karmic seeds that we're carrying around that haven't sprouted yet. There's a large misconception that I find common. is that we all have one karmic account, and we're seeing sort of the current balance in your karmic account. <laughs> and karma isn't one account. It's lots of different seeds. There are lots of different actions that you've planted in the past. Some of them are sprouting now. Some of them are going to sprout in the future. You never really know. This reflection helps you both when you're dealing with issues of compassion and also when you're dealing with issues of empathetic joy. In terms of a compassion, it reminds you that you never know when the possibility to help somebody can happen, can have an effect. As I said, their past, the seeds of their past bad actions may be flowering right now, but they may stop flowering in a moment. And you may happen to be the person who's there to help when the person is available, is ready to receive help. The same issue goes with sympathetic joy or empathetic joy. You see your neighbor who's wealthier than you are. Sometimes it's difficult to feel empathetic joy for this person because you feel, well, maybe you know, they're better off than I am. I'm a miserable person. Why am I wishing them to be even happier than they are? If you think in those terms, and I've run into people who do, you know, uh, remind yourself that you don't know what your karmic seeds are. You don't know what the other person's karmic seeds are. Maybe this person has you know, good karmic seeds that are about to fail. You never know. It's one to, thing to think about. At the same time, you see somebody suffering, as I said, and their, their good karmic seeds may be ready to sprout, so you might be there in the right, person, right position to help them. In terms of the Buddhist teachings on karma, also, there's no question of a person deserving happiness or deserving pain. This issue never comes up. And I think it's, and if you look at somebody and you say, well, that person deserves to suffer, that person deserves to be happy, but it doesn't seem to be that way. You have to remember, the Buddha doesn't talk in terms of people deserving suffering. He says there's actions that lead to suffering, there's actions that lead to, to pleasure. Karma is not a respecter of persons. It's simply a question of actions. Some people are really good people, but they may have some bad actions sort of hidden away. Other people, you, you, know, you say, you know, they smirk and they're horrible, and you don't even like to look at them, but they may have some good actions in the past. You never know. So there's no question about deserving or not deserving. Remember the story of Angulimala. He killed all those people. He becomes an arahant. And there were a lot of people who were still upset by the fact that he was going out for alms. They would throw stones and things at him. Um, and as the Buddha reminded Angulimala, okay, if you hadn't become an arahant, it would have been worse. <laughs> but still, they, there's a whole question. You know, why, did, why does Angulimala get to get away with having murdered all those people and only getting stoned in response? And the, and the answer is, well, Angulimala had lots of different actions. The, com the combined effects of his many different actions, both good and bad, resulted in the fact that he was able to become an arahant in spite of the fact that he had murdered a lot of people. So when you think about the issues of so-and-so deserving to suffer or so-and-so deserving to have, have happiness, remember, it's not a question of deserving. We have all kinds of karmic seeds in our background. If you looked into your karmic seed storehouse, um, you might find some things that you don't recognize. You say, I couldn't have done anything like that. But I, I usually my, I found that a skillful way of thinking when you know, something really outrageous happens to me is I say, well, I must have been outrageous at some point in the past. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is coming back. There's also the question about what about your own karma in the present? If you're resentful, for example, of somebody else's happiness, someplace down the line, when you get happy, there's going to be somebody resentful of your happiness. Do you want that? Think about that. At the same time, if you're hard-hearted towards somebody who is suffering, Someplace down the line, you may have that same sort of suffering. Do you want to meet up with people who are hard-hearted with you? So this helps you think in ways that get over, say, resentment for someone who's happy, uh, an idea that someone so-and-so may deserve to be miserable. Helps you get, get over those ideas because you think of things in terms of actions and their results. The teachings on karma not only help you understand exactly what it is when you're wishing for happiness, but also helps you understand desire. As I said earlier, unlimited goodwill does not come naturally to us. It's something that you have to actively generate 
And the generation of a particular desire is actually part of the path. It comes under right effort, as the Buddha says. You generate desire to give rise to skillful states. You get, generate desire to get rid of unskillful states. In order to generate that desire, first you have to see that it's in your interest to wish for happiness for other people. And the Buddha gives basically three reasons, or three analogies, or one of them is an analogy and two are basically reasons. The first reason is um, that if you're able to develop thoughts of goodwill, unlimited goodwill, that's a greater guarantee that your actions are going to be skillful, that you're going to act in ways that you're not going to regret later. You don't want to carry around a lot of bad karma, and the best way not to carry around a lot of bad karma is not to do the bad karma to begin with. And if you're able to call on attitudes of unlimited goodwill or unlimited, unlimited compassion, you're much less likely to do harmful, hurtful things. Even in situations where people would normally expect you to do something harmful and hurtful, you can say no. Because you realize that you've, you've been able to develop this attitude. You see somebody who's hurting you, and you see that person you know, as, as a fellow human being who's creating the causes for suffering, and you feel compassion, rather than feeling hatred over what, what they've been doing to you. The Buddha's most graphic analogy here is when he says that even if bandits attack you with a two-handled sword and are sawing off your limbs, he said, you have to feel compassion, starting with them. You have to feel goodwill, starting with them. And we're often told that when you first start a practice of goodwill, you start feeling goodwill for yourself. But in the case when you're being attacked, the Buddha says, start with them. Feel goodwill for that person. The memorable story I heard several years back of a woman who was um, doing metta meditation in New York City and she had gone to a, an art class earlier and had done an abstract painting and then had gone to her metta class and was doing it metta meditation and then it was late at night and she was riding back on the subway and she was the only person in the subway car and sitting there with her abstract painting and these teenage kids come into the car and they start making fun of her painting so what is this? This looks like a lot of garbage. This looks like a lot of trash. What is this? And she looked at them, and instead of feeling fear, and she'd been practicing metta, and all she could see was see these poor, suffering kids. And so she explained her painting to them. She said, well, this is trying to express this, and this is trying to express that. And the kids were dumbfounded. And so they said, well, thank you. No one's ever explained this to us before. <laughs> so you see what an attitude of goodwill can do. It can help you do skillful things. Secondly, the, an attitude of unlimited goodwill, as the Buddha said, can help mitigate the results of your past bad karma. The analogy he gives is of having a, a, rock, a rock crystal of salt. Okay, it's about the size of your fist. Now, if you put that in this glass of water, could you drink the water? And the answer, of course, would be no, because it might be way too salty. Now, if you put that rock crystal of salt into a river, could you drink the water in the river? And the answer is yes, because the water is so much more than the salt. The Buddha said in the same way, when you develop an attitude of unlimited goodwill, all four of the Brahma Viharas, your mind is like that river. It's so large that whatever results of past action, bad actions come in, you hardly feel them at all. So again, it's in your own interest to be able to develop this unlimited attitude. A third image that the Buddha gives when he talks about seeing somebody that you don't like, seeing somebody that you hate, he says, look for their good points. So it gives you a basis for having goodwill for them. And then he also goes on to say that if they don't have any good points, then feel a lot of compassion for this poor person who <laughs> is going to suffer really badly next time around when he can't live in an undisclosed location. <laughs> but the analogy the Buddha gives, if you see somebody who's, say, who's been really nasty to you in their words, but they're actually helpful in their, in their deeds or vice versa, he said, it's like seeing a tiny puddle, uh, a cow print with a little bit of water in it. You're coming along, you're in a desert, you're hot, you're trembling, you're thirsty, and there's this little bit of water in the cow print. Now, what do you do? You can't scoop it up with your hand because that'll muddy the water. So what you do instead, you get down very carefully and you slurp it up. Now, the other person's good things are that valuable. Now, the image, think of yourself as you know, someone who's going through the desert, you're hot and trembling. If all you focus on are the bad points of other people, that's going to make you even thirstier and hotter. In other words, what the Buddha is saying is the good points of other people are like water for us. They're nourishment for us. Learn how to focus on them because you need them. Okay, when you think in these ways, you see that it really is in your interest to be able to spread goodwill even to people you don't like. 
even to people that you have trouble with, even to people who have been cruel to other people. You say, you've got to have goodwill for those people. It's in your own interest, as well as being in their interest as well. So the question is, once you see that it's in your interest, how do you actually generate the desire? And this is where another one of the Buddhist teachings on causality is important. And this is teaching on fabrication. If you've ever looked into dependent core arising, it starts out with ignorance. And on ignorant, based on ignorance is something called sankara, or fabrication. Now, fabrication here, the Buddha says, is of three kinds. There's bodily fabrication, there's verbal, and there's mental. And these are the basic raw materials of our emotions. Bodily fabrication is the way you breathe. Verbal fabrication are the things that you focus on and the way you comment on them to yourself. And finally, mental fabrications are the feelings and the perceptions you have, the kinds of labels that you put on things, and then the feelings that you feel as a result. Now, if you look at any emotion you have, it's going to be made up of these three things. The way you breathe, which gets the emotion into the body. This is why emotions have so much power than just a passing thought. It's basically an emotion is a thought that's gotten into your breath and from your breath into your hormones and your hormones into your body, which is why it seems so real and so insistent and so much you. Um, and what the Buddha is saying is, is that you can, you can change these things. And one of the best ways to change to begin with is start with your breath. When you're feeling anger towards somebody, ask yourself, well, how am I breathing right now? How can I change the way I breathe so I feel more comfort in the body? Because often the problem when you have anger is there's this great sense of discomfort in the body and you've got, you feel you've got to get rid of it. And the way of getting rid of it is, is either to bottle it up, which of course we know is what turns it into the thing. This tentacle comes under and it scoops up and it eats Ken Russell. Or it turns, you know, you, or else you express it. You, get, you try to get it out of your system by expressing it. And of course, what that does, it creates more bad karma. So the Buddha is giving another alternative for dealing with this bottled up feeling of anger, which is learn how to breathe through it. Use your breath in a way that you create feelings of ease in the body. You look at his instructions on breath meditation, and the first half is about creating a, a, a sense of ease, a sense of comfort, a sense of rapture, simply by the way you breathe, and allowing that ease and rapture to fill the body. Now, when you're able to to have that physical sensation of rapture and ease, it's a lot easier to let go of your thoughts of anger, at least not to take them so seriously. You can look at them with more objectivity. You can see, okay, what in this particular feeling of anger do I have here is really useful? I mean, in other words, is there something that really needs to be worked on, something that needs to be done? And which parts can just be let go? But you're operating from a sense of physical ease. It makes it a lot easier to examine your emotion. Secondly, you look in terms of your perceptions. In other words, if you feel that this person is attacking you, this person is creating a lot of problems, you see this person simply as a force of evil, change your perception. Remember, these are human beings who want to be happy. Okay, look at that and keep that in point in mind, because they want happiness is simply that they're going about it the wrong way. Now, is there some way that you can help? That makes it a lot easier to feel goodwill for them. And then when you're dealing with them, when you're coming from goodwill, it's a lot easier for them to respond. So in this sense, starting by changing the way you breathe, starting by the way you change your perception of the situation, reminding yourself that you are hot and trembling and thirsty, you need the goodness of other people to feed on. You need the goodness of other people to make sure that you don't start acting in unskillful ways. So that you can look at the situation as an opportunity to develop the proper attitude, is developing goodwill when you need it, regardless of the person, regardless of the situation, when it's called for. Empathetic joy, compassion, equanimity. When you learn to get in touch with your emotions and realize that you not only just get in touch with them, but learn how to deconstruct them. The, many times the idea of getting in touch with your emotions is that your emotions are what you really are and that you've been divorced from your emotions and you want to get back in touch with your true nature. Your emotions are not your true nature. They're just as fabricated as anything else in the world. Okay? And so if you see you've got an unskillful emotion around something, you learn how to take it apart in terms of these elements of fabrication. The breath, perceptions and feelings, um, and direct the thought and evaluation. Take it apart and reassemble it in a new way. And these teachings on causality and the teachings on karma help you think in ways that are more skillful so that you can actually reshape your emotions so they're more appropriate for the situation. So this comes down, down to back to the point I started out with, which is if you get your head and your heart to talk to each other, they can have a much better conversation. Your heart needs the help of your head in order to feel more skillful emotions, in order to act on more skillful emotions. And your head needs your heart to remind you, okay, what's really important in life? 
the whole issue of suffering and putting an end to suffering. So they need to need, need to learn respect for each other. Your head needs to learn respect for the, the suffering of the heart. And your heart needs to learn respect for the principle of causality. You know, the things don't work simply because you wish them, but if you learn how to work within the causal system of the world, you can actually bring about more happiness. You can bring about an end of suffering if you learn how to play the system right. So, so have some respect for the fact, okay, we live in a, in a causal system that you have to learn how to master skillfully and you learn how to use your intelligence in order to understand the system so that you can then train your heart. And the two of them working together, you actually can take the Buddhist teachings, which are intended to put an end to suffering, and actually use them for their intended purpose. So those are my thoughts on the topic. Is there, are there any comments, questions? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 I, I must admit, I get tired of Dharma talks when people talk about one idea for a whole hour. I, I <laughs> So I'd like to throw out a few more ideas. <laughs> yes. You have the example of the... Oh, excuse me. Don't bother. Oh, when you have the example of the, your friend who's... Um, the landlord's asking for the mm-hmm. falsification of rent. Mm-hmm. What I was kind of like thinking to myself, that would it help for her to ask him what his motivation is in those circumstances or not? She had already tried that. She was, he was not forthcoming. Oh, I see. She knew his motivation. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Thank you. I have a question about the cheetah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wondering, does it reside in a particular uh, part of the body? Not really, no. No? Okay. Just hand back down. This is not really a question so much as a comment and an appreciation that... Um, I just came back from a retreat, and at some point in the retreat, I began to feel like um, I had this simile for what I was feeling, which was that I was making cookies, and I had all these ingredients, and they were in front of me, and I knew what they meant, what they were supposed to do, and you put them in the bowl, and you make cookies. But at some point, I did all that, and I put them in the bowl, and nothing happened. And so your sort of your last comment there about being able to have your head and heart talking to each other and knowing what's the appropriate thing to do is just reinforce that for me. Thank you. Good. Good. I have a question about, oops, <laughs> <laughs> your comment that Buddhism uh, doesn't start with the premise that people are good because I've been operating as if it did. And I've also read different luminaries who have said that it does. If you look at, the, at the Buddhist, what the Buddha said in the Pali Canon, there's no mention that people are basically good. He starts with the assumption people basically want to be happy. And he says there's nothing wrong with that desire if you learn how to use the desire skillfully. And the problem is, again, if, if you can't come up with people being basically good, then there's a question of why is there so much cruelty in the world? And you could say, well, people, you know, their, their good nature got obscured or something. But if, if, that's, if goodness is our true nature, how can it get obscured that way? It's a lot easier to, to, to focus on the idea that, okay, everybody wants happiness. If every part of you, skillful or unskillful, all of your actions are based on the desire for happiness. And then you can get them into a dialogue. In the same way, when you talk to somebody who you find is a very difficult person, Okay, you, you, the best way to dialogue with that person is to say, okay, I understand you're looking for happiness. And I think that maybe you're doing it in an unskillful way. You may not have, be able to explicitly say that, but that's if you're coming with that attitude. Okay, you're saying, because okay, the person's basic motivation is something you can work with, but it's got to learn how, you've got to learn how to take that motivation and make it skillful. Um, in, in reading suttas recently, I came across the discussion the Buddha had about um, covetousness, to, to covet the belongings of others as being a, something that generates negative karma. 
And I'm still having a little trouble wrapping around that. I can see that wanting what someone else has and taking it mm-hmm. is negative karma. But just having that thought in your mind of, I want what he has. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just wondering if maybe you could say some more about that and how that is a generator of negative karma. Okay, well, if you don't put that thought away, if you let the mind feed on it, you start acting in unskillful ways. And so you have to recognize, okay, this is the seed for an action that could be harmful down the road. Now, if you see, okay, so, you know, your neighbor has a car, and you decide, I would like to have a car just like my neighbor's. That's not called covetousness. That's just plain old desire. Covetousness is you want that car. (laughs) And you can see how that could be very unskillful. (laughs) If you see us good cars, say, I want to work hard so I can have a car like that. That's called being, you know, Diligent, hardworking, mm-hmm. which is not which is not a vice necessarily. So that's the difference. Okay. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yes. And back there. If I should be so um, unlucky, if I can use that word in this context, as to have somebody with a two-handled sword mm-hmm. uh, decide that the way to fulfill their happiness is to take my purse. Am I to not defend myself? You can defend yourself, but you don't kill the person. And and I then should harbor no malice towards them? Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for the person. There was a very touching article that was in the Shambhala Sun a while back about a woman whose son was killed in a gang war. And she had to sit through the trial where she saw the, the guy who had killed her son. And... You know, she'd been practicing Tonglen, which is the Tibetan practice of you know, exchanging suffering and, and happiness. And she, felt, she said you know, during the trial, she actually was able to do it for the guy who had killed her son because she began to see him as just one other suffering kid in this world who didn't have any manners, didn't have anybody you know, that the kid could rely on. And so after the kid was in jail, she thought you know, she might, after the kid came out of jail, she thought she might try to track him down. So that thought was in her mind. She went to a retreat and she was doing a, a metta or tonglen kind of kind of practice, and she found that when the issue of people that you find difficult to feel goodwill for came up, it wasn't the kid who had killed her son; it was the kid who had gotten her son into the gang to begin with. That was the person that was coming up and up and up and up in her mind. And so after the retreat, she sought out that kid and started talking to him. And she realized that he, like all these other kids in that area, were just totally lost. There was nobody to mentor them at all. So she you know, wanted to be their mentor. So she started meeting with the kids on a weekly basis. Now, what, was, what I found really saddening about the article was that, you know, for all of her retreats and everything, she said, when I talk to the kids, I feel, I feel their pain, I feel their, their, their difficulties. I don't know what to tell them. And this is a this is a problem. We, we, you know, we do vipassana retreats, and we do metta retreats, or we do emptiness retreats and tonglen retreats. And the wisdom side doesn't seem to be talking to the compassion side. What's the last word you use? The compassion side. We develop metta, but then when when push comes to shove, and you actually are dealing with someone, it's a very difficult situation. What wisdom do you draw on to help? This is why I think it's, it's good to bring in the teachings on causality, the teachings on karma, so you can understand that if you harbor malice for that person, it's not going to help you, it's not going to help the person. And this is why you want to you know, sort of deconstruct your attitude of malice, see what it's made of, see what the assumptions are lying behind it, and then write, try to reconstruct a new attitude in its place. I would think in the immediate situation of being attacked, yeah. for me to defend myself, I'd have to be pretty angry to be able to, mm-hmm. to take those steps to protect myself. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let it pass then. <laughs> and remind yourself, and always keep, keep in mind, this is one of the reasons why the precepts are so short. Don't kill the guy. Okay. <laughs> ah, red light, that's good. Um, how do you, when, when you can help, when should you choose not to help? Like you're, you're having a family reunion and your sister doesn't have money for the plane ticket. Mm-hmm. And you know she doesn't have money because she hasn't been spending her money well. Mm-hmm. And if you just send her money for the ticket, is that helping her because she comes into the family and gets some emotional support and maybe will begin to see a better way? Or is that hurting her because you're encouraging her to not 
Learn from past bad actions. <laughs> no, really, that is really your call. I mean, that, that's one of the areas where it's, it's not a moral issue. There's no principle that you can apply across the board. You might want to do it once, and then if you find that she's taking your money and spending on alcohol or something, then it's okay, not the next time. But it's, I mean, it's, it's really, that's one of those areas which is sort of neither. It's totally your call. I'm still a little bit new to this, and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about true nature versus feelings as expression of true nature. Okay, your feelings are based on your thoughts, what you've been taught, um, attitudes you've picked up from other people, um, associations you've had from the past. Now, they feel strong because they get into kind of your hormone system, and they just seem to take over your body. And it's good to realize that just because that thought took over my body and got the hormones going doesn't mean that's necessarily my true nature. It's simply a cause and effect relationship that this pushed a couple of my buttons. Now, if you see that allowing your buttons to be pushed like that is not a skillful thing, that it's really harmful to you and to the people around you. you say, okay, I've got these buttons. Let's take them apart. Let's analyze them. And this is where the teaching on not-self is useful, that you don't, have to anal- you don't have to identify with an unskillful pattern of behavior. If you think it's your true nature, you can't change it. But if you start looking for the causes and conditions that brought it about, you can actually change those causes and conditions, put you in more in control, so that your desire for happiness actually becomes effective rather than being limited by ideas about you know, who I am or what my nature is. That actually was part of my question, um, the part about deconstructing an attitude and, and uh, constructing a more helpful one. It would be helpful for me if you would give another example, kind of showing how it might be worked through. Okay. Okay, what kind of emotion do you want to talk about? Um, I suppose either anger or guilt. Anger or guilt. Yeah, guilt, maybe guilt would be a different topic. Um, so, you know, you see someone, you really care about them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just like you say, and, and the equanimity really isn't there. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, you, you don't have such a good day. You, you know, you kind of hear you're enjoying this talk and you're benefiting and you kind of imagine the other person is still uh, suffering. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, You start out, is, is, is this a feeling of guilt you're talking about? Okay. Okay, your feeling of guilt, is that going to help the other person? Not at all. So you think about the other person. What can I carry from this situation that would actually be helpful to the other person? Think in those ways. And say, so, okay, if you're carrying a feeling of guilt or regret around, okay, you might want to analyze, why do I give in to these feelings of guilt? Does it come back from that little childhood belief that if you feel guilty enough, you won't get hurt? The world doesn't work that way. The more you grind yourself down with feelings of guilt, the less energy you have for actually responding to a skillful way to the situation, whatever situation you face when you go back home. So so think in those ways. And then again, how do you feel physically around that feeling of guilt? Can you notice what the physical feeling is? Can you then change the way you breathe so you feel a feeling of refreshment in the body and then take that refreshment and let it spread through your body and then carry that sort of embodied sense of ease back to the other person? That's actually a gift to other people. When you, when you aren't weighing yourself down with a lot of unnecessary stress and strain and guilt and remorse or whatever, you're bringing sort of a lightness of being with you. You're more present for the other person. You're, you're able to think more skillfully about what the other person needs and what you can do for the other person. So you're actually helping the other person by de- cultivating this way of relating to yourself physically and emotionally. So it's not that you get the happiness and she doesn't get the happiness. You get some happiness and maybe you can spread it to her. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, the thought about not wanting to disappoint. Mm-hmm. How, how would you say work with that? You have to look at the standards that you're measuring yourself against. 
or the other person is measuring you against? Do you believe in those standards? Because simply disappointing another person, you're not, we're not here to please other people all the time. We're here to do what we think is the most skillful way of bringing about happiness. Okay. That includes me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I can see I've sparked a lot of questions. Maybe next time I come, we can continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Continue the discussion.